<clears throat> All right, so we'll talk about acute brain injuries now, the big brain bleeds, and headaches. So subretinoid hemorrhage uh, is what you should suspect any time a vignette tells you that a patient is having the worst headache of their life or somebody who said that, followed by having an acute decompensation with somnolence or a coma. And that is just always what I think when I read that in a question. And other signs can be, you know, neck soreness or pain, meningismus like with meningitis. But a key here would be that sudden onset headache, likely without a fever, nausea and vomiting from increased ICP, and alter consciousness or somnolence or even a coma if it's a big enough bleed. And remember that ruptured, you know, berry aneurysms are the most common cause. Trauma is another cause, but less likely you encounter trauma on your medicine shelf. And the best first test to order, if you're asked, is a non-contrast CT of the head, where if this has happened, you're going to have a hyperdensity from the leaking of the blood. And usually that's going to be multiple little hyperdensities around the middle of, of you know, a subcortical area, the middle of the brain. It's hard to describe. I, maybe I should have attached a, an x-ray. I figured that might be copyright infringement, though, and I didn't want to get in trouble. Um, and so if you happen to have a question where you have a slam dunk case, you're just, you're not convinced that it's not subarachnoid hemorrhage, even after your CT of the head is negative, you should order a lumbar tap and that should be your choice in the test. And if a lumbar tap tells you that there is xanthrochromasia, which is that yellow reddish color to the, to the LP, or if there's a high opening pressure, then you would have a, your confirmed diagnosis of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The next thing you could do is a CT angiography, uh, which will help you to isolate maybe what the source of bleeding is. So there's two opportunities on the shelf where you might choose CT angio as your answer. That is, after you had a positive CT of the head or a lumbar tap, or if you had negative results for both of those tests, because sometimes people have what you call a sentinel bleed, which is a mild bleed that resolves and isn't big enough to see on CSF or on CT, but they're at high risk for bleeding later on. And if a question describes somebody like that, you want to get a CT angio to make sure that there isn't an underlying aneurysm that's going to rupture later on. Then an epidural hematoma, classic symptoms, trauma, where they lose consciousness, get better, then deteriorate again due to hematoma expansion, lens shape opacity, and surgery is going to be the answer for management. Subdural, subdural hematomas are a little bit trickier, but remember that they're due to tearing of the bridging veins, and they like to give you the scenario of an old person who fell or hit their head or fell down in the bathroom. Not only are they elderly at risk, but so are alcoholics. So uh, anybody who has brain atrophy and those bridging veins are sort of tethered with more room to you know, monkey around, they're going to be at higher risk for a subdural hematoma. And people who are on Coumadin or any of the novel anticoagulants like a Pixaban are going to be at increased risk for a chronic subdural hematoma development as well. Now the tricky part of subdural hematomas is that there can be acute symptoms that are as bad as maybe even an epidural hematoma, or they could have indolent, slow development of symptoms, and even chronic subdural hematomas, and they may have some dizziness or lightheadedness, they may develop apathy or cognitive dysfunction, they might progress over time to the development of somnolence or even seizures. Okay, uh, so, and again, you diagnose this with a, with a, with a CT scan, um, and more than likely, I think usually subdural hematomas can be described so vaguely, usually being able to diagnose it uh, when you're given a tricky clinical scenario is going to be enough on the shelf. And this is a classic shelf topic that will be on your medicine shelf and on your neuro shelf, and it's idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri, and it classically occurs in young, large females, and they usually describe frequent headaches that are more common in the morning along with visual symptoms like blurry vision or pain with eye movement. They likely describe pain behind their eyes as well. And it turns out that pain with eye movement is actually a fairly specific uh, symptom when they have morning headaches uh, and you're suspicious for this condition. Unlike in a migraine, these patients are not going to have an aura or a warning before the headache comes on. And like I said, they usually have it in the morning. 
and on your exam, classically, you're going to see papilledema from the increased ICP, and you might even have a six nerve cranial palsy where they can't move one of their eyes to the right or to the outside, excuse me. And then classically, they may also describe a lumbar puncture that has an increase in the opening pressure. And know the drug associations because this may be what they want you to recognize in the clinical vignette is that somebody who's on a vitamin A supplement or isotretinoin for acne, I mean, you can imagine a young female who's taking isotretinoin for acne management, it's a classic vignette that is going to be likely pseudotumor cerebri, but even birth control pills or corticosteroids could do it as well. And then if you want to diagnose it, you have to do a CT of the head, and that's probably more important to rule out that there's not a mass brain tumor in their brain. Uh, and then, again, an increased opening CSF pressure would help you diagnose this. Then for treatment, if it's medicine-related, all you have to do is to remove the medicine causing the problem. If it's not medicine-related, then acetazolamide, which is a diuretic that increases bicarbonate excretion, sort of lowers the osmolarity in the brain, uh, can help reduce ICP. And also, uh, one symptom that I forgot to mention is that if you do a lumbar tap, it may improve their headache. And one of the treatments can actually be repeated lumbar taps to improve their headaches. Now we'll talk about more of the routine headaches and how to differentiate them. Uh, and you'll start off with the migraine, which classically we recognize with an aura, uh, some kind of feeling that the headache is going to come about and it's unilateral with throbbing, nausea and vomiting are common as our photophobia, which is sensitivity to light, uh, or also sensitivity to noise is common as well. Then there's the tension type headache, which I'm only gonna mention here, and you should recognize it as a headache that occurs frequently, but they're able to continue their daily activities and it doesn't interfere with their life very much, and it's a band light pressure sensation around their head. Cluster headaches are a very testable topic, and I'm not sure why, but it's not a common thing, but it's a unilateral severe headache that comes along with autonomic dysfunction usually, like tearing or nasal drainage. And uh, these people, well, we'll go over that in a minute. And then again, someone with the worst headache of their life has subarachnoid hemorrhage until proven otherwise. So how do we treat migraines? Uh, yeah, how do we treat migraines? So someone has a migraine, first line treatment is NSAIDs, but that's usually not going to be the answer on your shelf. So the best first drug to give is the tryptan drugs. And we call these abortive agents because you give them after the migraine's already started, and you probably already know that. And know the mechanism of action, they're serotonin agonists, they, they inhibit release of vasoactive peptides, which is important for you to know because it causes vasoconstriction, which means we don't want to give it to people out of a theoretical risk if they've had an MI or a stroke or if they have uncontrolled hypertension, so someone with a blood pressure of 200 over 100, do not give them a tryptan drug. And somebody who's got Prinz metals angina, which is ST elevation from vasospasm, should not receive tryptan drugs, even if they're on verapamil. And you cannot give these to pregnant patients either. Dopamine agonists like metoclopramide, chlorpromazine, these are good because they have an anti-nausea effect as well as helping with the headache. But if you give one of these agents and they may tell you that, they want you to know that you should give diphenhydramine to prevent akathasia or dystonic reaction since these medicines can have similar effects to an antipsychotic agent. And then ergotamine, which is never going to be the answer for the treatment, but they may want you to know side effects and contraindications. Uh, and I, I misspoke there because it's really, I think, the only thing you're going to need to know about this is that it is an absolute contraindication to use ergotamine if somebody has ever had an MI. Okay, so heart attack, you can't have ergotamine. You really can't have tryptans either. So you're just going to have to have a headache probably. Uh, so how do we prophylactance migraines? Just a word about this. Uh, really, anybody who's got debilitating symptoms or more than four headaches per month or headaches that aren't responding to abortive therapy, they can get daily prophylaxis to prevent their migraines. So all the medicines that I'm about to show you are equally effective, and the answer on your shelf is going to be what medicine both can treat their headache, doesn't have a contraindication, and what medicine can treat a comorbid condition. So somebody who has hypertension, a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker is a good option. Amitriptyline or venlafaxine are going to be better for people who have comorbid depression or other mood disorders. And then topiramate, or as they call it on the street, dopamax, is going to be good if you have obesity, as it can help treat that as well.
cluster headaches. Behind the eye in the temporal region, unilateral, severe, acute onset of pain. Classically, these headaches wake people up at night when they're trying to sleep. And a key to the diagnosis here, and the question is that these people are going to describe, they're going to be described as restless, moving around, you know, they can't sit still, they're in so much pain. In contrast to a patient with a migraine who's going to be much more likely to want to lay in bed quietly and be left alone. And then I mentioned this briefly a minute ago, but the autonomic symptoms like eyelid drooping or pupil contraction, tearing, conjunctival injection, all on the same side as the headache are going to be extremely suggestive, if not pathognomonic, for a cluster headache. And the duration of these headaches is important for you to know, which is a few minutes to a couple of hours, but not as long as a migraine usually. And these people go for bouts of about six to 12 weeks or even months where they're having these headaches on a daily basis several times a day, followed by remission. And the clinical vignette is likely to tell you about that because that is characteristic of this disorder, unlike in migraines, which usually don't have a remission period. The acute treatment is a sumatriptan drug or sumatriptan subcutaneously and 100% oxygen by face mask. That's the one they usually want you to know. So make sure you have 100% oxygen for a cluster headache memorized. And know that you can offer prophylaxis against these cluster headaches with verapamil. And lastly, trigeminal neuralgia uh, is, is relatively easy to separate from a cluster headache if you know the classic symptoms, which are shock-like pains that come on out of nowhere but are usually, they can be triggered by someone touching your face or even a bad smell. Uh, and the key here is that the symptoms only last for a few seconds, but they're severe, sharp, shock-like pains, and they usually occur, or they have to occur, along the distribution of cranial nerve 5. And if they happen to occur along the V1 branch that goes across the eye, then they might have some of those autonomic findings that we talked about with cluster headaches. But again, the, the key differentiating factor here is that they only last for a few seconds rather than for 15 minutes to three hours. And what I think you want to know for the shelf is that trigeminal neuralgia patients can be treated with carbamazepine. 